Please take your Bibles and go to Nehemiah chapter 2, if you would, please. Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah, I would say, is probably a book that is designed for uh, leaders. And as we go through this particular book, we're going to be drawing out some leadership principles. I've entitled the message this morning, God's Good Hand. God's Good Hand. As you know, we've been preaching through in light of our building program through Ezra, as well as Nehemiah. When we preached through Ezra, we mentioned how that the altar was reestablished there in the city of Jerusalem. And of course, we know that God always deals from the inside of a man to the outside of a man. We have the tendency to work opposite. We put the emphasis on the outside and we sometimes minimize the importance of the inside. But God here has laid out his word for us and he mentions this. He says, hey, establish a relationship with me, deal with the heart, deal with the soul. And there you have the rebuilding of the temple there in Ezra. And now we come to the rebuilding of the walls. We already dealt with uh, chapter one. We looked at the man, Nehemiah. We saw some of the problems he was faced with, the situation at hand in Jerusalem. We saw his prayer in chapter one, and now we'd like to get into chapter two. Now, Nehemiah had God's good hand on him. Have you under, uh, ever wondered why some people seem to have the blessing of God upon their life and others do not? Is it because of their background? Is it because they uh, have some sort of a special birthright? Is it because they have rubbed shoulders with someone in particular? Uh, no, none of that really matters in the eyes of God. We see that uh, Nehemiah had a vibrant relationship with God himself. You know, the blessings of life are not given to somebody uh, by accident. It doesn't mean when someone has God's good hand of blessing upon them that they're free from problems. We look at some of the Bible characters like a Joseph, which we don't have any indication. Uh, we know he's, he's human, of course, but we have no indication of any sins that he committed. But at the same time, he's a type of Christ in the Old Testament. And we find that God blessed him in all those various circumstances that he found himself. His brothers hated him. And God's good hand of blessing was on him. He was thrown in a pit and sold into slavery, and yet God's good hand of blessing was on him. And then we find he was sold again to Potiphar. God's good hand of blessing was on him. We also find that he was accused of rape and thrown into prison, and God's good hand of blessing was on him. We also see that he was elevated eventually to number two in the kingdom there of Egypt. God's good hand of blessing was on him. So don't think that God's good hand of blessing means that you have a life with no issues and no problems. But 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Amen? And I want us to see some passages of Scripture here that seems to be nestled within the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and just reference God's good hand. If you'll look here in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, verse 10, it says, now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. God's good hand of blessing is a strong hand, amen? amen. If you go to chapter two, and we're gonna read this entire chapter eventually, but I wanna just point these verses out that just emphasize God's good hand. In verse eight it says, in a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. One thing that's telling to me in this passage of scripture is we find Nehemiah really giving glory to God. He's not trying to say, hey, you know, like I'm, I'm somebody special. He's just saying, look, God's special and his hand is upon me. Look at verse 18, if you would, to the same passage of scripture. He says these words, then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. If you'll go now, flip one book over to the book of Ezra, and let's go to chapter seven, chapter seven. Now you know there's four main personalities that God gives us in Ezra and Nehemiah. We know that there was Zerubbabel and uh, as well as Jeshua, they came 
uh, as part of the dispersal and coming back to the city of Jerusalem. They came first, then came Ezra, and now we're into the book of Nehemiah. But in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 9, the scripture says these, For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. If you'll drop down now to chapter 8 and verse 18, the Bible here says, And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mahali, the son of Levi. And so we find, again, the emphasis of God's good hand. Folks, you and I want God's good hand on us. And here it says in verse 22, he says, For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So once again, we see the importance of having God's good hand. And we see these personalities that God is using to reestablish and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, God's holy city that was special to the Israelites, and they're all recognizing God's good hand. And so we need to understand that principle as well. And it's amazing when you have God's good hand, uh, that's a special hand. That is an omnipotent hand. And you know, when you see the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, you find that it was with his hand that he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he touched blind eyes, he caused the deaf to hear again. My, that good hand. And that's the good hand that we have with us all the time as believers and as we walk in fellowship with him. Now, if we go back to our text passage of scripture, I want us to see, I've got it, I've got it uh, laid out in outline for uh, chapter 2, and it's as follows. We find Nehemiah's appeal uh, in verses 1 to 8, and then we find the assessment here in verses 9 to 16, and then we have his attitude in verses 17 to 20. And this is an uh, outstanding leadership principle that's being brought out to us in this particular chapter, and we're going to work through this chapter and we want to see, first of all, the appeal. Let's read the first eight verses of Scripture, if you would, please. And it says, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. I want us to see, first of all, under this aspect of the appeal, that we find that Nehemiah processed the situation. And I want you to stay with me uh, through the, these, uh, these points of the message, because I think it's very important that we, uh, we can save ourselves a lot of trouble in life, uh, not just as pastor and church leadership, but also in every area of life that we find ourselves, 
there's some great principles that we find laid out before us on how Nehemiah handles this situation. You see, when we looked at chapter one, we saw that here we find Nehemiah working in Shushan the palace. The children of Israel has been dispersed. They, that means they've been really dispersed or sent out throughout the uh, kingdom uh, there with the Persians and the Babylonians first and then the Persians. And we find Nehemiah at the Winter Palace. And he finds out that the city of Jerusalem has been laid waste. And he begins to sit down and he weeps. He's broken hearted by the terrible news that he hears. And he's broken hearted because he knows that the people are also in disarray. He also knows that God has brought judgment upon the nation of Israel. Now, when we get into chapter 2, if you look at Nehemiah 1.1, 1, 1, and then you look at chapter 2, verse 1, the events that happen from chapter 1 and chapter 2 take in about four months. And see, the Jewish calendar date started in March. And so this is around September. And so here we find that Nehemiah has been carrying this burden for some four months. Very interesting to me. And then I say this in my notes, when dealing with issues, you should give time to work through the emotion and deal with the situation. In other words, you act, you don't react impulsively. One thing you notice as you study this passage of scripture, and we just got through with Ezra again, we see here where these men assess the situation. They, 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 they looked at what needed to be done, but they gave themselves time. As we see him in bitterness of heart, he sits down there in chapter one and he just weeps in the indication of the scriptures. He almost, upon first hearing that news, he weeps uncontrollably. He can hardly contain himself. He's grieved in his spirit. The king has taken notice of this. And so I, I, I see here where we have to be very careful. Many times as parents, we get ourselves in trouble because we act impulsively. We spout off real quick and we say things we wish we hadn't said. It's like water spilt on the ground. You can't gather it again. You say, oh, if I had to do it over again, I'd back the truck up and I, I'd get another start at this thing. The problem is once it's said, once it's done, you can't go back and undo it. And that's why it behooves us as we walk in the power and energy of the Holy Spirit of God that we take the time to work through our emotion because many times if we allow our emotions to control us, we do the wrong thing. Why is it that we find Peter in the New Testament as we've been studying his life on Wednesday nights, we find him acting impulsively and Jesus has to rebuke him and Jesus has to warn him and Jesus has to pick up and do damage control. As he cuts off Malchus's ear, he reaches down in the dust and picks up Malchus's ear and puts it back on his head and heals him because Peter's acting impulsively. And you and I will do great harm to the cause of Christ if we act impulsively and allow our emotions to dictate what we do rather than put it in place the spirit, the soul, and the body. And that's why we ought to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God, amen? And not our mind, will, and emotions, as well as the body. And so it's interesting that we find in chapter two, this appeal that's being made by Nehemiah. I, th I think it's just fascinating to see how he handles himself in this situation. He's not an employee, he's a prisoner. Now, he's got a, a place of honor to be sure. Uh, evidently, he's, he's uh, earned that right to be where he is. But of course, as I mentioned last week, as a cupbearer, uh, yes, he was in a place of honor because he was there in the presence of the king, but he's the one that tasted the drinks first. He's the one that ate the food first because as been in the history books uh, from not only this time, but really all time, we find that poisoning the kings has been something that they always had to be careful of. And so the cupbearer, before he gave the king something to drink, he would taste it first. Because if it was poison, he would drop dead first before the king would. So, you know, it's sort of a mixed bag, honored position, but yet maybe not quite so honored, you know? And so we find Nehemiah in this position. And so as he is making this appeal, it's interesting how 
because of his position and his attitude and the way he carries himself and approaches the authority, we find that the authority is more than happy to just open up his arms and make the way possible for Nehemiah to go to the city of Jerusalem. I mentioned last week when we looked at Nehemiah's prayer that Nehemiah prayed about his response here. If you look at chapter two and verse two, wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. I mentioned this again last week in light of this particular situation. Kings did not like sadness in their presence. They would actually hire what they call court jesters to come in and tell jokes and funny stories and things of that nature to make them happy, to make them laugh. They would also hire singers to come in and they would have people sing in their presence to keep their spirits uplifted. And so with Nehemiah being sad in the presence of the king, that could very well seal his death warrant. And so we find here that I was very sore afraid. And then as the king asked him what, you know, what he's doing, he says, I make, in the end of verse four, he says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. So we find here that right away, he's transparent before the king. And I, I say this, when dealing with issues in life, be open and honest with authority. Work through authority. And some people say, yeah, but authority won't let me do this, that, or the other. My friend, as it says in, I think it's uh, Proverbs chapter, uh, I forget what chapter it is now. He says, but God does work through authority. He works because he holds the heart of the king in the hollow of his hand. And as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. And that's how our God works. He works through uh, authority, as I mentioned, as we preached on the home last Sunday night. And so we need to understand that biblical principle. You say, but you know, he won't let me do what I want to do, or she won't let me do what I want to do. God can change that heart, can he not? Yeah. Well, I know it's quiet. <laughs> and the reason it's quiet is because we say, well, you know, does that really work? Or I know situations where it didn't seem to work. Folks, we either believe the Bible or we don't. We either decide that we're going to go by the Bible or we're not. If we start making exceptions where the scripture does not make exceptions, we get ourselves into trouble. And so you and I need to be extremely careful how we handle ourselves, even as Nehemiah is talking to his authority. And you notice how he operates within this. He prays about his response. And you and I would do well in the situations of life to say, Lord, how should I respond to this? Should I be quiet? Should I speak? Or should I give it time? Or how should I respond to this? And uh, that's the best thing at times you can do is just call out to God, amen? And just say, Lord, help me. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. Because he does not have the opportunity to say, uh, let me get back to you in a week, king. Let me, let me have a month and then I'll get back to you. No, he doesn't have that opportunity. He has to answer right away. And that's when God will work in those types of situations as well. But he works, God works because you're depending on him. Not that you're just flippantly doing what you think is the best thing to do given the circumstances. And so we see Nehemiah prayed about his response. I also see this number three in dealing with authority. Nehemiah was polite. Nehemiah was polite. Look at verse three, if you would, and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? You notice right away he's respectful in the presence of the king. If you'll also look at verse five, and I said unto the king, if it please the king. He was not demanding. He wasn't saying I want to do this or this is what you need to do, do for me and this is the way it's going to be. And you know, I've served you all these years and proven myself and so on and so forth. No, he says, if it please the king. And if thy servant have found favor, in thy sight. <laughs> in my notes I said, don't be a bull in a china shop. I said this, I said, you attract more with honey than vinegar. And you and I need to remember that through the situations of life. You know, that would help us in business, that would help us in our home, that would help us in church, it would help us in all areas of life, would it not? Uh, look at verse seven. Seven says, moreover I said unto the king, if it please the king. Look at verse eight. 
and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So right away we see that Nehemiah was respectful and he was polite. Look, I also see this, that he had a plan. I just read verses seven and eight. And right away when the king begins to say, you know what, I'm gonna let you go to Jerusalem and I want you to rebuild those city walls and I want you to put those gates back up. Folks, that's something. That's, that's a, a huge answer to prayer. Because, you know, as the criticism began to flow after Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem, we find that they were, the, the, the criticism was, oh, you're going to be a rebel and all this kind of stuff, you know. And that was so far from the truth. And so we see here where uh, this king would be concerned that if he gives this right to the Jews to rebuild the city, that somehow they may make insurrection. And we find that people tried to put that onto them later on to the king. And so we find here that this is really something. But at, at, at the same time, we find that Nehemiah had a plan that needed to be worked out. He didn't just stew over a problem, but he sought for a solution. That's important. Uh, many times you will see a problem that maybe no one else sees. And it's not so that you can criticize, it's so that you can be part of the solution and not part of the problem. It's easy to pick things apart. It's another thing to find something that needs to be improved upon and be part of the solution to fixing that problem. And so sometimes God may let you see something so that you can be that change agent. And here we find that happening. I mean, it was common knowledge throughout the, the dispersal of the Jews that the city of Jerusalem was lying in waste. And so it moved upon the heart of God. I mean, Zerubbabel and Jeshua heard about the need that needed to happen, that the altar needed to be reestablished and the temple rebuilt. Nehemiah hears this word and saying, look, the city is in shambles. The gates have been burned with fire and there's big gaping holes in the, in the walls of the city. And, you know, what are we going to do? Oh, it's too bad. It's just too bad. Look what the happened here and look what happened there. And boy, if they would have just done this, this wouldn't have happened and so on and so forth. And boy, you got all these what ifs and problems and nitpicking going on. And here Nehemiah says, oh, God, help me. And God says, you know what? I want you to be part of the solution. And he places the burden to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem upon Nehemiah. God knows who he can trust. And so we find him of all the people that heard about it, God reaches down and touches him. Oh, that's a good hand, amen. And so we find here that Nehemiah had a plan. And then number five under my notes, Nehemiah was given permission. And you know, obviously, Nehemiah was not a bitter man for the circumstances of life. Folks, you're going to have all kinds of things happen to you in life. Man is born to adversity as the sparks fly upward. Sin is rampant in the world. It's not getting any easier. And at the same time, we see here where uh, even though he had all kinds of things happening, then he was in, he was in captivity. He was some 700 miles from the city of Jerusalem. I mean, this was not an easy place for him to be in, and yet he wasn't bitter about his circumstances. You know, when I think of these Bible characters, I think of Daniel as well. He didn't get bitter. Joseph didn't get bitter. And none of us have gone through what Paul has gone through. And yet, Paul didn't get bitter. You and I can't afford to be bitter. Uh, bitterness eats us up and then uh, adversely affects those around us. And so you've got to make sure that those offenses that happen to you, uh, 
that you deal with them before the throne of grace, give them over to God and say, you know, God, you can take care of this problem a whole lot better than I can because you see the beginning and you see the end and you know everything in between. And so I'm just going to say, this is yours, Romans chapter 12, and just give it over to God. Amen. So obviously <laughs> he was not bitter. And he did his job well, regardless of where he was circumstantially. But I also noticed this, he was bold. I didn't say he was brash. I didn't say he was rude, but I said he was bold. And we find him approaching the king and he says, look, king, this is what I'd like to do. He was bold in his request. The king asked him and then he said, and sometimes we're so mealy mouth about what we want to do and what needs to be done. And we sort of tiptoe around the tulip, so to speak. And so then we don't really express ourselves. And then we wonder why nothing really happens. And he, we find here in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse one, it says, the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no man pursues. If you're standing on the truth of the word of God, if you're doing right, you don't have to be apologetic for it, amen? And so we see that Nehemiah was given permission by the king. God was working providentially in his uh, situation. Uh, when we look at the whole account here of the captivity, you have Ezra, you have Nehemiah, and then the next book is Esther. And this all happened within the same time frame of the nation of Israel. And Esther, God, is, his name is not mentioned at all. But you see the providential hand of God in the affairs of mankind. God is at work. Never forget that principle. God is always at work. And then we see here, Nehemiah was given provision. I say this from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 where it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God's work, someone has said, done God's way, will never lack his supply. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be rolling in money. It doesn't mean that you're always going to have money that you, have, you, you feel like you need to complete a project. But at the, if God's behind it, he's going to see to it that it gets done. And sometimes his delays are also his appointments. And so sometimes when he doesn't let us do the plans that we have figured out, it's because his plan is better. And he's trying to help us as we yield to him on a day-by-day -day basis. He's saying, look, I am, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this work, I wanna use you, but yet you know, you've got this laid out and I've got other plans. It's just like Gideon. He, the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and said, look, I want you to destroy the Midianites, I wanna give you victory. And here, you know, he begins to make excuse in Judges chapter 6. But then he gets 30 some odd thousand people, their troops, and the Lord says, you know, you'd like to fight with these guys, but I've got to trim your troops down because if I let you have this victory with 30,000, then uh, you're going to take the credit or some of the people are going to take the credit. And God says he's not going to share his glory with anyone. And so he says, you know, uh, let's, let's trim it down to 10,000. Well, then the Lord said, no, 10,000 is not going to work either. I'll do it with 300. And that seemed like an impossible task, but God had a plan. And God is also teaching something here. And so it's amazing when we let God's, uh, God do his work that he wants to have done his way. And when it's done his way, he always provides. Amen. Now I say this, when God calls you to something, he will complete it. That ought to help Bible college students. Uh, because I always say this, that before God builds a ministry, he has to build a man. And so he'll put you through some, some uh, crucibles, I say, of trials. He'll put you through some situations in life because he's preparing you for the future. And so many times he uses the prep time outside of the classroom as you're taking classes, and he'll teach you more outside the class room than he does inside the classroom. But it's all happening simultaneously. You say, boy, I'm going to Bible college because I want to learn this particular book of the Bible and I want to learn, and that's great. But at the same time, don't miss the other things that God is teaching you that surrounds that. Amen. 
Because as he teaches you that walk of faith, he teaches you through the experiences, he teaches you in discipline, he teaches you in so many ways. And that is in preparation for the work he wants to do in and through you. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hang on that promise for a while, amen? I, I wrote this question in my notes. Do you really want what you can do or what God can do? Do you really want what you can do or what he can do? And I put this in parentheses. Look at creation. That's what God can do. And when you have God's good hand of blessing upon you, you get what he can do, not what you can do. And so we see here, that's, <laughs> that's just the appeal that he makes. Let's look at the assessment here in verses 9 to 16. Uh, verses 9 to 16, we see how Nehemiah now, he's gotten the letters of authority. Now he begins to assess the situation, the work that needs to be done in the city of Jerusalem. Let's look at verse 9 down to verse 16. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Folks, let me just say, I may say it later, but I won't say it now. And that is, hey, when you set out to serve God, the devil's going to be right there at your heels. He's going to be hitting you for all he's worth. And that's what we find here. Not only, man, it just seems like everything is working out like, you know, butter on bread. And here we find this right here where he goes to the city of Jerusalem and the critics are right there saying it can't be done. If God's called you to a place, he will see that that works out to his honor and glory. He'll do that. And it says here in verse 12, and I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. I mean, Nehemiah said, you know, I'm not telling anybody what God's told me because if I tell them what I think God wants us to do, it's going to make us all scared, <laughs> you know? And so sometimes leaders, sometimes parents, sometimes the pastors, sometimes other leaders in positions of responsibility, there's some things that they have to hold close to their chest. And that's the way God works. And so it says here, he says in verse 13, and I went out by night by the gate of the valley even before the dragon well and to the dung port and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that I was uh, under me to pass, that was, uh, <laughs> was under me to pass, sorry. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priest, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. So here we find the assessment. Nehemiah number one, observed the principal parts needed to rebuild the walls. He assessed the situation. Folks, that's uh, going back again to the appeal. We see where Nehemiah didn't act impulsively. We see that he looked the thing over. And you and I would do well as we live life to just assess our lives before the throne of grace. That we would assess the very situations that we get into and know whether we need to proceed or back off or you know, need to wait a bit for, for God's clear direction in a matter. And we find Nehemiah going around and he's looking things over. He hasn't talked to the government leaders yet. Notice here, there's those leaders in criticism that we're introduced to. Sanballat, Geshem, Tobiah. They're just right there to cause trouble. And I, I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, where Paul, writing to the churches of Galatia, he says, who did, he said, you did run well. You were doing so well. 
Who did hinder you? Who did hinder you? You and I have to be careful of the who that will hinder us from pursuing to its full measure God's work and blessing in our lives. Galatians 5, 7. That's not me saying it only. <laughs> That's the Apostle Paul who's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And so you and I need to listen carefully to the illustration and lesson that God has given us through Nehemiah because he's told us that the Old Testament scriptures are given for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so this is not just history that we're reading here. These are truths that we can learn to put into our lives that will save us a lot of trouble and guide us when we are in trouble. Okay, and so here we find the assessment. Then not only do we find Nehemiah observing the principal parts needed to rebuild the walls, we see that planning number two is constant and essential in serving God. There's never a time where you just say, hey look, you know, I, I walked down an aisle one time and I gave my, uh, uh, I rededicated my life to the Lord. You know, you only get saved once, right? But what happens is there are times where Paul says, I die daily. He says, I have to rededicate my life every single day. I, I just lay myself on the altar and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm dead today. It's like somebody said to Lee Robertson, you know, you need to die to praise and you need to die to criticism. And the only way to do that is to walk in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit of God because you'll get both at times. But here we find that planning is constant. And you'll see as we move through the book of Nehemiah that Nehemiah assesses the situation, then he begins to organize, but all through the building process of 51 days, we find him reassessing and handling the situations as they come. Because you know if you're building a place, you've got all the blueprint there and you're working on the blueprint, but all of a sudden you say, you know what, uh, this isn't right here, or we need to make this adjustment that would be better suited for our, our application here, and so on and so forth. And you begin to assess and reassess, and you begin to make alterations and so on. And that's the way it's gonna be in your Christian life. Don't think as I surrendered to, uh, to full-time work when I was 16 years of age, that that was the end of it. It was just the beginning. But there's been a constant reevaluating, and not the reevaluating the call, but reevaluating the assessment of how I could continue on to fulfill God's plan and purpose for my life. So as you, as you follow the will of God for your life, there's going to be some uh, liquidity to that. There's going to be some maneuvering going on. Not that you're waffling, not that you're going back on the call of God on your life, but yet you're just working within that call to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish considering all the variables that come in. The world, the flesh, the devil. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we find here that planning, he observed the activity of the city for three days. Once again, I don't know what you're getting from this message. But uh, time and time again, as I was addressing these particular parts of the, the chapter, I just see once again that impulsiveness is, is missing here from Nehemiah. I mean, he saw the devastation, and yet he didn't act impulsively. Here he goes at night when nobody knows, and he assesses the situation, and then he sits back for three full days, and he just watches what's going on. Just watches what's going on. Just, just as observing, hmm, I, I see that, I see that. Should I say something? No, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna observe. And we find here he observed the activity of the city for three days. Then he discreetly surveyed the city with key men. He didn't just tell everybody, hey, this is what God, I'm, I'm here in Jerusalem to do this. No, he assessed the situation and little by little he begins to let the vision out. And leadership understands timing, and leadership understands human nature. That's why it's so critical for dads in the home to understand timing and human nature and operating within the home. Same with the church, and it would help our government leaders as well. 
And then we find here, in God's work, you should constantly assess. So here we find Nehemiah making the appeal in the first eight verses. We find in the next eight verses, he gives the assessment, but I like his attitude here in verses 17 to 20. Let's read it. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste. He's talking to the men now. He says, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. Folks, let me just say, as I read that just a moment ago, it, the thought came to me, and I hadn't thought of it before. But the thought just came to me, you know what? I wonder if the church of Jesus Christ today is a reproach to the world. If they see us as non-essential, what a mockery. Our great God, the one we sang, wonderful grace of Jesus. We look at creation, we have the hope that lies within us. Amen? We, we're saved, we're on our way to heaven. And here, the Babylonians, Persians, the people surrounding the city of Jerusalem, city of the Jews were a reproach. And I wonder how much of a reproach the church of Jesus Christ is today in our communities. My, what a thought. Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. God's work is a good work. In the midst of all the problems and troubles and hassles and hindrances and shipwrecks and all that goes with it, it's a good work. It says here, but when Sanballat, look at verse 19. Here he's saying, okay guys, this is what we need to do. We need to rebuild this city. And the people say, yes, let's go do it. And right away, but <laughs> when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? I like his answer. Then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Amen. I like this, that Nehemiah had the attitude that it can be done. It can be done. It's amazing when we had the privilege of coming here almost 32 years ago. In fact, it would be 32 years ago, the 12th of next month, when we moved to Canada. When we moved to Canada, I can remember people saying, oh, you can't do anything as far as starting a church uh, down in southern Manitoba. But God said we could. It's not us. It's God's good hand. You know, now people are saying, well, now I understand why there's a good sound church in uh, Winkler, Morden area. Because uh, you're in a Mennonite community. It's a religious community. And so because of the religious community, then it's easier to build a church. Well, how does that work? You know, years ago, you couldn't do it because you were in the Mennonite community. Now, because it did work, it's because you're in the Mennonite community. Now, you know what it is? It's God. And may we never forget that. It's God. He can put up a, 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 a candlestick and he can take one down. We need to remember that. And so we find here that he had the attitude that it can be done. God had led to this point, so Nehemiah had the confidence to carry the job through to completion. Because as he looks at these guys who are now opposing him, <laughs> you know, he says, hey, hold it now. I was in Shushan the palace in captivity, and I found out what the city of Jerusalem, how it was lying in waste, and the gates of the city had been burned with fire. And yet I saw how God answered this prayer and this prayer and this prayer and this prayer. And now you're going to come and criticize and try to keep me from doing what, the, what God's laid upon my heart? No way. No way. It's not going to happen. God will see it through to completion. And my, he did in 51 days. He was careful, though, to continue casting the vision. Many times through the years, I've stood up in this pulpit 
when we've gone through some deep waters and valleys and I've said, folks, it doesn't change what God has called us to do. And God has called us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so what we need to do is we need to keep doing what God's called us to do. Nothing's changed. And so don't let the clamor of all that stuff that's happening on the outside hinder what we need to do for the glory of God. And I also see that he had the right attitude toward his critics. I just read about verse 20 where he says, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. You know what? He's telling his critics that. He's not just thinking this. He's not just whispering to his buddies. He's telling his critics. He says, you know what? Uh, this is what uh, it says in the scriptures. He goes, uh, but ye have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. I said this in my notes. God was behind this, this project. And it says, God will provide. We will get it done. And it's none of your business anyway. Amen? Amen. 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 Question I have for you. Do you have... God's good hand on your life. Do you have God's good hand on your life? You can, if you're right with him. He's promised to bless you all your days. Nehemiah was blessed because he walked with his God and he had a vibrant relationship with him. May I remind us, Nehemiah was not a preacher. He was not a politician. He was a layman. And God blessed him. God's good hand of blessing was on Nehemiah. You don't have to be a preacher to have God's good hand of blessing on you. 